you know, the idea that you go on a, somebody else's platform, you have to appease them, you have to cater them, you have to soften your own philosophy, you have to uh, uh, disengage your own mind in order to make them, uh, you, know, you, know, you know, to suck up because they're paying you is absurd. When I taught at a Catholic university, I didn't become Catholic. When I taught at a Jesuit university, I didn't become a socialist. I, I mean, it is, it, is, it is nuts and it is despicable, despicable that anybody would even think that that is an appropriate thing to do. More Scott, bleh, you know, just bizarreness and ridiculousness. Uh, the idea that, that you, you have to cater to the people that, that invite you. I, I went to Tea Party uh, conferences and told them exactly what I thought about their ideas. I mean, if you can't, if you don't have the balls, the guts, if you're such a coward as you will adapt your ideas to whoever the audience is, then you are exactly that. You are a coward. You are a coward. All right. Let's, um, you know. So let's talk about one of the classes, uh, a class that I've never really gone through in terms of actually teaching. And uh, I'm, I'm kind of, I want to play around with a little bit of the structure of it. So this is an experiment for me. Uh, I will remind you that, uh, you know, uh, uh, this is done. Uh, you know, I can't do this without your support. And uh, we've already been going two hours. And uh, John just made that two hours a little bit more profitable. Uh, but it, it, it's still, we're still only about halfway to where we need to be in terms of actually um, justifying this. So, uh, uh please consider supporting the show. You don't have to ask a question. You can just use a sticker. You can use a sticker for a dollar, five dollars, a hundred dollars, whatever. You can use a sticker. So, uh, yeah. yeah. All right. So what is it? What is it at the end of the day that makes, at the beginning of the day, at the end of the day, what is it that makes capitalism so productive? What is it about the economy under capitalism that you know uh, 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 makes it possible for us to be as prosperous, as wealthy, as rich, as well off as those who live under capitalism are. What are the fundamental philosophical, or sorry, what are the fundamental economic principles that make this possible? Well, what is the fundamental? What is the fundamental challenge? What is the fundamental question the economic asks us? What is the problem that, if you will, economics is trying to understand, is trying to solve, is trying to big forward? What is the fundamental problem at the end of the day, really, of human existence, of human life? What does human life require? Well, human life requires that we, we produce, we create that which we consume. We are not a being that just goes out there and discovers the means of its survival. We're not a being that just goes out there and knows the means of our survival. We are being uniquely among all animals that actually has to produce our values, that actually has to produce that which allows us to survive, to thrive, to flourish, to be human, to live as human beings. So the first thing one, has, one looks at from an economic perspective is the question of production. What needs, what needs to exist? What kind of social organization, what kind of social system allows for production and how does it do so? Now, what is capitalism? Capitalism is a system that leaves people free. It's a system that by leaving people free, it unleashes the human mind. 
The human mind needs freedom, the absence of physical force, in order to be able to function, in order to be able to think, to integrate the evidence that it accumulates through its senses and apply it to the challenge, the problem of existence, of producing the values necessary to exist. So capitalism leaves individuals free to produce, but more importantly, it leaves them free to innovate. It leaves individuals free to discover their values, to figure out what their values are, what they should be, what they could be, what is possible. It leaves individuals free to use the ingenuity in order to create new products, new things that didn't exist before. Capitalism leaves the innovators free to innovate, whether it's the creation of the steam engine, whether it's the creation of the sewing machine, whether it's the creation of a, you know, a semiconductor, the chip, the, all the different elements that today are responsible for our modern technological uh, world, all of those had to be thought of. Somebody had to innovate. Somebody has to create. Somebody had to make them a reality. So... Uh, I, I'll just comment on a, on a chat. Marx was not the first one to coin the term capitalism. Capitalism was coined before Marx, but we'll leave it at that. So the first and foremost thing that capitalism makes possible is innovation. Innovation at every level of production. At every level of production. Uh, uh, natural resources. Think about how we used to get natural resources chop down trees, dig into the ground. Today, we have massive machines that could dig into the ground. We have extraction machinery. Soon, we will be sending robots into mines and thus reducing the risk to human beings basically to zero. And of course, it is human ingenuity, innovation, that has resulted in the creation of new natural resources. Yes, I said that right. The creation of new natural resources. Before the middle of the 19th century, oil, you know, that black gunky stuff that today fuels our civilization. That black gunky stuff before the middle of the 19th century was not a natural resource. It was a natural pest. It was a natural pollutant. It indeed reduced the value of any property on which it was found because there was no use for it. It was just black gunk coming out of the ground. It polluted, couldn't grow anything on the land. So even natural resources, in a sense, are products that the human mind actually creates, actually comes up with. It takes whatever nature provides us. That's wrong. It takes whatever is in nature and reshapes it for human use. And that is, that is what innovation is all about. That's what ingenuity is all about. That's what entrepreneurs and innovators and businessmen do. And that's what capitalism gives them the, in a sense, freedom to do. Freedom to do. And by protecting their property rights, it allows them to benefit directly, personally, individually. It makes self-interest, the self-interest of the entrepreneur, the material self-interest of the entrepreneur, and the spiritual self-interest of the entrepreneur completely consistent 
with production, with the production of the material goods necessary for human flourishing. So, uh, you know, entrepreneurs go out there, they innovate, they build, they make money doing it, but they also have fun doing it. It's a challenge. It's something that stimulates their mind. It's something that engages them, challenges them, and therefore spiritually fuels them. And of course, materially benefits them all because of the concept of property rights, which capitalism, of course, protects. So on the one hand, it gives them the freedom and protects them from the initiation of physical force by their neighbor. But innovation, it's important to note, is not only limited to, for example, uh, particular products from natural resources all the way to finer products that we might use. Innovation is also applied to organizational structures. For the 19th century, uh, basically there were two forms of organization for business. Uh, one was partnerships, and one was basically government charters that allowed you to do certain things by government permission. And you had to apply, and it usually came with some kind of monopoly power, some kind of exclusionary rights. And that allowed for some economic progress, but was very limited. Partnerships can only grow so big. They have a hard time raising capital, growing in terms of the amount of money they can raise and therefore invest. They are very risky to the partners because they have full liability. They, each one of the partners is liable for the debts the business takes on. They have a finite life. When the partner dies, it's hard to find a replacement. Not conducive to large, capital-intensive, and long-living, productive organizations. A government charter, you know, goes against the whole principle of freedom. It goes against the whole principle of property rights. It requires permission. But capitalism is a permissionless society. Permissionless. It also restricts the freedom of others by giving you a charter, by giving you exclusivity, other people don't get. So one of the great innovations of the 19th century, innovation, by the way, just for this crowd, libertarians, for example, hate, is a limited liability corporation. This is a, a, a legal structure which allows for the raising of large quantities of capital. It allows for the development of professional managers. It allows for the separation of control and ownership, for management and ownership. As a consequence, it can raise capital from lots of people. They can trade that they can trade in the shares that they get in exchange for the money. It can exist forever. It does not have a limited lifespan. It does not depend on any particular person. And where anybody is willing to buy into this company because they know that all they can lose is the money they provide. That is, that they are not liable for the debts of the business itself. That's why it's called Limited Liability Corporation. So that innovation could not have come up without the, creative, the creativity, the innovation, the thinking of free people in a free economy thinking about property rights, thinking about how to create the best structures that allow for maximum innovation, maximum production over time. And then finally, and I'm not going to talk about this much, we'll do it, there's going to be another course on this, 
uh, innovation uh, it also extends into the realm of finance, into the realm of how these companies are financed, how the allocation of capital happens throughout an economy. Uh, so fundamentally, but the fundamental here is capitalism leaves innovators free to innovate. It leaves innovators free to innovate and create businesses around their innovation, to connect with capitalists, to fund it, to fund their projects, and to connect with customers who view their product as values. That is how capitalism fundamentally functions, by connecting entrepreneurs, businessmen, innovators, with the capital necessary to grow their businesses and with the customers necessary, with the, with, the, with the customers who then, who are the valuers, who are the people who consume, who value what is being produced, whose lives are being improved by the very fact of production. And it leaves every step in that process free for people to figure out, to innovate around, to shape, it frees every single interaction, it leaves it free to be voluntary. It makes clear that none of those interactions is allowed, is force allowed into. Now, the consequence of this freedom to solve the problem of production is that people indeed specialize. This brings us to the second big cause of why capitalism is so effective, and that is the division of labor. People can now specialize in what they know, in what they can get better at, at what they are particularly good at, and they can, by, by specialization, Adam Smith has shown, economists have shown over and over and over and over again, that what happens when you specialize is you dramatically increase, you dramatically increase the productivity of your labor. If all you do is make one thing, even if you're better at making all things than anybody else, if all you do is make one thing and let other people make the one thing they are best at doing, even if their best is not as good as yours, but now they've specialized in their best, and then you trade with them, everybody is better off. It's better after, it's better off, and it's obvious to us in a modern society, but remember, this is... Not always so. Doctors be doctors. Chip manufacturers make chips. And even there, there is a division of labor. There are some companies that specialize in making chips. Other companies specialize in designing chips. Other companies specialize in using chips. Apple, for example. But it also designs chips. But then there are companies that only design chips. And then specializing in building the equipment that makes the chips. And then there's another company that specializes in making the mirrors that the equipment manufacturer uses to make the equipment that makes the chips. And if somebody tried to do all those things, they would never advance as fast. They would never advance as far as when every one of those is specialized, every one of those is focused on the one thing that they do best. So the division of labor is huge, but it's not, it's, it's, it's multidimensional here. Division of labor just simply economically, it's obvious that people who specialize, if everybody specializes in something, 
the world is a better place. We're all better off. The economy runs smoother. More wealth is created. But there's something much more important going on underneath this. Before the Enlightenment, before capitalism starts taking off, people didn't have a choice about the work they would do. People didn't have a choice about what they would specialize in. In a, a pre-enlightenment era, everybody had to survive. Therefore, everybody had to do the things that were necessary in order to survive. They were, everybody had to be a farmer, had to grow the food that they would consume. You had a, you couldn't specialize, or you could only specialize in one thing. Now, there were some craftsmen and others, but even they didn't get to really choose what they did. They got to be, they, they were in that profession because their father was in that profession, because his father was in that profession, because their father was in that profession. They belonged to guilds who restricted who could enter, and those guilds determined the rules by which this hereditary process happened. Individuals couldn't choose the work that they did. So while there was some division of labor, it was minimal. And as a consequence, one of the consequences of that, there's no innovation. And of course, over long periods of time, there was no real economic growth. It's only when we liberated people by allowing them to choose, to make choices about their own life, to make choices about their own profession, to make choices about how they wanted to live. In other words, freedom for the first time in human history, capitalism for the first time in human history, allowed people to choose what they wanted to become, what they wanted to do. Now, you can see that today. We are wealthy enough so that a child can be asked, what do you want to be when you grow up? 400 years ago, nobody was asked, what do you want to be when you grow up? Basically, you either farmed the land, you did what your father, want, you did, what your father did, if you were in some kind of uh, 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 profession, is not the right word, uh, uh, some kind of guild or some kind of um, uh, uh, work, tech work, you did, oh, maybe you became a soldier if there was a war going on. But there was no choices involved. There was no, hmm, I want to be a fireman. No, I want to be a doctor. No, I want to be in finance. No, no, I I'm, I'm actually want to go study programming. That division of labor, un what underlies the division of labor is the freedom of individuals to choose. And therefore, some of the benefits of the division of labor come from the fact that people now are choosing to do what they like doing, what they're motivated to do, what, they're in what, what they are spiritually incentivized to be doing. And therefore, you're always going to be better at doing something you love than doing something you hate. So one of the reasons the division of labor is so effective and continues to be effective in the world in which we live today is because people choose the work that they want to do and that choice allows them to choose to do something that they find or hopefully and find enjoyable and therefore they can be even more productive than they would otherwise be at doing it. So capitalism allows us the freedom to innovate in the name of production. And innovation is, the, is behind every step of production. It is what drives production. We're not still making widgets the same as we did 100 years ago or 50 years ago or 20 years ago. Constantly improving, constantly increasing efficiency, productivity, productivity, and therefore creating more wealth 
raising quality and standard of living. So capitalism allows, but also capitalism allows for the division of labor. It allows people to choose the labor they want to do. It allows people to choose the area they want to focus on. And then once people specialize, once people focus on that, then you get the massive benefits of specialization, which accrue, again, to all of us, but accrue primarily to the individual who now gets to do what they love, and because of capitalism's protection of property rights, they get to make a profit on what they do. They get to earn something for what they do. Capitalism, of course, because it's a system in which we can only deal with one another voluntarily, is a system of trade. It's a system in which we trade value for value. We don't take, we don't steal. We have to negotiate. We have to figure out what is value X worth to me. And that starts with what is my time worth to me. How valuable is my time? And therefore, we negotiate for our wages. We negotiate for what we're going to get as compensation for the time, the effort, the skill, the innovation, the expertise that we provide our employer, let's say. But it's voluntary. If we don't like it, we walk away. Capitalism, by protecting property rights and contracts, makes it possible to plan long term and to have trades that go on over the long run, but also articulate how these trades can be dissolved. I buy an iPhone for $1,000. It's because to me it's worth more than $1,000. To Apple it's worth less than $1,000. It's win-win. Capitalism allows us to discover and to engage in win-win transactions, transactions in which everybody is a beneficiary, transactions in which we can pursue our own self-interest, not at somebody else's expense, but indeed pursue our own self-interest where the other party with which we are trading is benefiting as well from the same transaction. And of course, as we have a greater, greater, greater division of labor, and more and more and more and more trade between the different people who are specialized, we gain more and more and more and more wealth. And you can see how a system like that, given the innovation and the production that is happening, elevates wealth, elevates quality of life, elevates standard of living, and allows people to choose their values and go and pursue them and gain them. Trade also works, as does the division of labor, both the division of labor and trade work uh, more effectively the larger the number of people you're talking about. If you have five people, engaged in specialization and trade among each other, it's better than all five of them being having to produce everything themselves. But you can only get so much wealth. There's only so much expertise that goes around among five people. There are only so many values that those five people can create. But when they five turn into 500 or 5,000 or 5 million or 5 billion, every time you raise the number, the growth becomes exponential. The amount of values being created becomes exponential. And the number of minds being oriented towards problems related to production, to the creation of the material well-being and the spiritual well-being, art and other things that we need in order to survive, the greater the benefit. This is why globalization is such a huge benefit to humanity and always has been. From the beginning of trade, trade was not just within the tribe. Even going back to Africa tens of thousands of years ago, there's evidence to suggest that tribes were trading between each other across vast geographic areas. Greece and Rome 
one of the great benefits of the Roman Empire is to establish one system of trade for a much larger population across a vast geographic area. And even then, there was trade that was engaged between the Roman Empire and other civilizations, India, even China, far, far away, because the benefits are massive. One of the things that capitalism promoted, allowed for in the 19th century and to this day is global trade, global division of labor. We don't just have division of labor within a particular arbitrary set of borders. We have a division of labor on a global scale, 8 billion people specializing, 8 billion people doing what they love to do, what they really want to do, what they're good at doing. And then they get to trade with one another. Then they get to exchange value for value and win-win relationships. But now it's not across five people or five million people, it's across eight billion people. And as a consequence, the amount of wealth is immense and the growth in standard of living uh, is dramatic. So freedom, capitalism, liberates the mind to innovate liberates us to choose our own profession and to trade with one another, free of coercion, free of force, free of an authority. It allows, and, and it leaves us free then, to engage in the entrepreneurial activity that innovators do engage in, the business activity, the business of creating and producing. It also encourages us to form into groups, associations, corporations, entities that allow us to maximize our productive capabilities, that allow us to, to benefit from each other's knowledge, each other's specialization. Remember, we're not only trading in material values, we often trade in knowledge, knowledge of markets, knowledge of just knowledge of products, knowledge of technologies, knowledge of the stuff we need in order to continue to innovate and to continue to progress. One of the great advantages with which we live today is that today we have a, uh, uh, you know, a relatively advanced division of labor society. We've got some problem with innovation and uh, with, uh, uh, you know, with entrepreneurial activity because of the degree of regulations and controls in which we find ourselves, we are not in a free capitalist society. But one of the things we do have is the ability to communicate, the ability to share information, the ability to benefit from the 8 billion minds working at the time. Now, that ability to benefit from the 8 billion minds and the 8 billion people producing, consuming, active in the world We get that benefit through, you know, the ability to communicate with one another, to talk with one another, to engage in activities. But, you know, but it, that also includes somebody in India writing an interesting book that I can then buy and read and all the consequence of the interactions between us. But, and, 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 and that happens because minds engage with one another, minds engage with ideas, minds engage with knowledge. But then another, there is another way that this happens that is almost like magic. This is what I think ultimately uh, people like Adam Smith, when they talk about the invisible hand, talked about. And that is the ability of markets, of producers and consumers in vast geographic dispersed areas to impact the decisions of one another without even talking to one another. And the means by which they do that is through the price mechanism. The means by which they do that is through, the, through individuals in every place demanding and supplying the goods that they need or the goods that they produce. 
And all of that information for millions and millions and millions, billions, trillions of transactions that are happening on a day-to-day -day basis, the, the, the transactions that are involved in production, the transactions involved that are getting raw materials, the transactions that are involved in then taking that produced products and getting it to market, the transactions that involve, because that's a transaction, right? You have to ship it, you have to get it to the place, you have to market it, you have to display it. And then all the transactions that happen between the seller and the buyer, every one of those transactions is intermediated by a price, by a price in which the buyer and supplier negotiate where they are willing to transact, where the relationship, where the transaction is a win-win for both parties, where both are gaining a value. And those prices filter through the economy. And they basically are sending constant signals. The price of semiconductors is expensive right now. What does that mean? That means that this, the demand is outstripping supply. Okay, well, is supply constrained? Is something happened that destroyed the bunch of supply? Okay, let's assume no. Then what is going on? Why is the price going up? Because maybe demand has increased. Oh, demand has increased. What does that mean? That means people are putting more and more emphasis on chips. They, they, they're buying more and more products that include chips inside of them. The value for a consumer is not the chip. The value is the iPhone. The value is the computer. The value is your car, which has lots of chips in it. The value is your refrigerator. The value is all the things that you have chips inside of them. Okay, so people are valuing things that have chips in them more and more. They're demanding more and more of those chips. Well, that means the chips are value. And it means that we need, that there's an incentive now because the price is going up to provide more of them. So more investment goes into making more chips to meet the demands of the chip, of the producers that need those chips. You know, changes in wages, changes in raw materials, the demand for them or the supply of them, or just, you know, uh, something goes out of fashion. We don't need it anymore. I don't know, at some point, the prices of typewriters must have plummeted. Nobody needs them anymore. We've got wood processors. So companies that made typewriters went out of business. People who own typewriters put them in the cellar, put them in a trash heap, stopped using them. So prices coordinate the economic activities within an economy. And again, it is freedom, it is capitalism, it is property rights that makes that possible. That is, people out there acting in their own self-interest without asking for permission, buying and selling the things that they value based on their own hierarchy of values, based on their own preferences, based on their own desires based on their own wants, based on their own thought. And it is that, those billions of people transacting away, which is then driving a price system, a price signaling mechanism that determines where investment is made, what products get produced, what products get dumped, where resources are allocated, Nobody sits on top making those decisions. They happen because of the division of labor, because prices serve to communicate this kind of information across the entire system. Capitalism allows for capital, labor, goods to move, to go to where they are going to be optimally used, to where they represent the highest value.
It is why capitalism is the most efficient system. It's because efficiency is built in. Efficiency means the satisfaction of values at the least cost. Well, that's the whole basis of the system of trade. It has a constant, ongoing you know, feedback mechanism. Prices, supply and demand, people's values are ultimately what drive the economic system that is capitalism. 